lessons on how Simon Petrus's Simless phone challenges Western miseducation systems and inspires African self-reliance, using the Igbo model and other African disruptors to strengthen the argument. But let's go deeper. This SIM-free phone doesn't just disrupt telecoms, it disrupts something even more powerful, the belief system that fuels global inequality. It punches a hole in the invisible wall built by Western education systems. Systems that condition young people to read, memorize and obey, but never to reason, question or create. Systems designed not to produce liberators, but laborers. You see, Simon Petrus didn't just build a phone, he cracked open the lie. Because if a Namibian teenager in a rural high school without access to elite laboratories or multi-million dollar research grants can invent a communication device that renders billion dollar infrastructures useless, then what excuse does the rest of the world have? Why are we paying $100,000 to attend Harvard? Why are our best minds drowning in student loans for degrees that lead to unemployment or job hunting? Why do we still believe that innovation must pass through the gates of Western validation? John D. Rockefeller, one of the architects of modern industrial schooling, once said, and that's exactly what Western schooling has produced, a global system that punishes creativity and rewards compliance, a system where genius must wear a tie, follow the syllabus, speak with a Western accent, and wait for approval before acting. But Simon didn't wait. He didn't ask for permission. He didn't study at MIT. He studied his surroundings. And with leftover television scraps, he created a device smarter than the phones you find on the shelves of luxury stores. No SIM, no airtime, no towers, just brilliance. And he's not the only one. The Igbo people of Nigeria are living proof that African minds can thrive outside colonial educational frameworks. During the brutal Biafran War of the late 1960s, the Igbos were isolated, blockaded and denied resources. But what did they do? They built, they innovated, they manufactured their own fuel refineries, developed indigenous communication systems, built weapons and vehicles with no outside help, created a parallel economy under siege. That's what happens when education is geared towards problem solving, not just passing exams. Today, Igbo dominated regions continue this legacy of applied intelligence. Their schools and apprenticeship systems produce real world doers, not theoretical dreamers. Harvard itself has reportedly studied the Igbo model to understand how these so-called uneducated Africans build generational wealth, resilience, and innovation without the need for Ivy League degrees. Let that sink in. Call the fucking police. Well, I don't think you should call the police for this one because the police work with the same people who will try or plan to take this young man down. A young Nambian man invented a seamless and airtime free phone that can make calls to anywhere in the world. Do you know what this means? This means AT&T is going to have problems. T-Mobile is going to have problems. Verizon is going to have problems. All these other companies who charge people for a phone are going to have problems. So this young man better be well protected because we are living in a time where greed is at its highest. People are greedy out there. A Namibian teenager built a phone that could collapse a global empire. In a world where making a simple phone call has turned into a luxury, where SIM cards lock people into expensive contracts and telecom monopolies control the lifeline of communication, a revolution is quietly brewing, but not where you might expect. Not in Silicon Valley, not in the labs of Samsung or the halls of Apple headquarters. No, this revolution begins in the most unexpected of places. The dirt roads and classrooms of rural Namibia. And at the heart of this upheaval, a grade 12 student named Simon Petrus. A young genius who defied every odd, every boundary, every institutional limit placed on African youth. He didn't have a shiny lab, he didn't have corporate sponsorship. He didn't even have stable electricity, but he had vision. And with it, he built a mobile phone that doesn't require a SIM card, doesn't need airtime, doesn't rely on traditional cellular towers. A phone that uses radio frequencies to make calls regardless of network availability. Let that sink in. A completely network-independent mobile device. And the world responded with deafening silence. Why? Why didn't CNN cover this? Why didn't BBC, Al Jazeera or Bloomberg run front-page features? Why is the story of Simon Petrus not trending worldwide? Because this story wasn't supposed to happen. It doesn't fit the narrative. It exposes too much. It threatens too many industries. If you thought the tech world was about innovation, think again. It's about control. And control hates disruption. Simon's phone, built using scraps from old televisions, includes a built-in television, a light bulb, a fan, a charging station for other devices, and a radio. And the price tag? Just $147. In a world where tech companies are charging over $1,000 for phones that still require SIMs, contracts, roaming fees and app subscriptions, a high school kid made all that irrelevant with components found in e-waste. 
He was just 18 when he unveiled the phone at a regional school competition in Namibia. He represented Abraham Iambo Senior Secondary School in the Ohangwena region. His school was underfunded, his family unemployed, and yet with sheer grit and determination, he changed the conversation. He didn't just win the regional competition, he stormed into the national finals. And he had done it before. The previous year, he invented a two-in-one seed drying and cooling machine. But even then, some judges whispered that he must have had help. They couldn't believe a high schooler, a black high schooler from rural Africa, could do this alone. His teacher, Taimi Vatileni, cleared the air. The only help Simon got was from us, his teachers. He came up with his own project. This is his mind at work. But the system doesn't want you to believe that. Because if a young African can build such a disruptive device, then the myth of African dependence shatters. Then the multi-billion dollar telecom industry has a problem. Then institutions like MIT, Harvard and Silicon Valley look over-glorified. Then the world must re-evaluate its standards for innovation. And that's terrifying to them. Let's talk consequences. Telecom companies rake in billions every month from network usage. From the moment you dial a number, you're being billed. Sometimes you get charged even before the call connects. International calls? Even worse. They milk people dry with roaming fees, hidden taxes and overpriced data bundles. Now imagine what happens when millions of people can call each other without any network provider. What happens to Atandi, T, Verizon, T-Mobile, MTN, Airtel, Vodafone? What happens to their empires? They collapse. Or at least they crumble enough to panic. And so Simon's phone was not mainstreamed. It was buried. It was reduced to local headlines and brief mentions in African tech blogs. The same thing happened with Maxwell Chikumbutso, the Zimbabwean inventor of the self-powered generator, and with Tabiso from South Africa who built a water-powered car. There's a pattern here, a disturbing one. Meanwhile, in 2025, let's look at the so-called flagships. Apple's iPhone 15 Ultra, Samsung Galaxy Fold Ultra, Huawei Mate X6, Google Pixel Pro 10, Xiaomi 15 Ultra, OnePlus 12 Pro, Red Magic 9 S Pro, and the mystical Blue Devil phone. These devices cost a kidney to own, literally, but what exactly are we paying for? A camera that takes better selfies? A screen that folds? A bigger battery? Sure, these are flashy, but what real-world problems do they solve? Let's ask the uncomfortable questions. Can these $1,500 phones edit videos without third-party apps? No. Can they perform real-time music covers or studio mixing without external software? No. Can they detect lies or measure stress through biometric data? Not really. Can they perform real-time facial motion capture or produce holographic projections? No. Can they kill mosquitoes using ultrasonic waves or LiDAR systems? Absolutely not. Do they call without a SIM or carrier connection? Hell no. Do they have anti-crack self-healing screens that remove the fear of dropping them? Still no. So what are we buying, really? An overpriced digital leash that takes nice photos. It's 2025 and phones have AI, but most of that AI is just predictive text and facial recognition. There's no life-changing revolution packed inside these devices, just more gimmicks to make us upgrade yearly. Meanwhile, Simon's phone does more with less. It solves connectivity inequality. It works without networks, off-grid functionality. It charges from built-in radiators, resource accessibility, built from recycled components, multi-purpose needs, built-in light, fan, radio, TV, charging hub, affordability, all for under $150. And it came not from a $10 billion R&D budget, but from the backyard of Africa. You see, the suppression of African innovation is not accidental. It is strategic because for centuries, Africa has been viewed as a continent of resources, not resourcefulness. The West doesn't mind Africans mining coal town for smartphones as long as they don't make the phones themselves. The global economic blueprint was designed to keep Africa exporting raw materials and importing finished products. When Simon made a finished product, one that could break the very system that exploits his people, he became dangerous and so silence fell. Deafening systemic silence. But this isn't just about Simon. It's about a global awakening. It's about rethinking who has the right to innovate. It's about redefining where genius can be found. It's about recognizing that intelligence isn't a privilege of geography. It's the inheritance of humanity. Simon doesn't have a Twitter account. He isn't on Instagram flaunting his lab coat. He isn't a tech influencer. But he has achieved something that engineers at Apple and Samsung still can't do. Build a network-free communication device. And he did it on a budget less than the cost of a single iPhone screen replacement. Let's dig even deeper. What Simon has created isn't just a phone, it's a symbol, a symbol of resistance against forced dependency, a proof of concept that breaks the spell of techno-colonialism, a blueprint for other youths to follow. Because the truth is, if one student in a rural school can do this, what happens when 10 try? What happens when a 100 Simons rise? What happens when Africa stops asking for permission and starts building independently? We get a new world, one where billion dollar companies aren't the gatekeepers of progress. One where communication is a right, not a luxury. One where knowledge is not hoarded but shared. One where no child has to wait for Silicon Valley approval to change the world. Simon Petrus has ripped the veil. He's opened Pandora's box and now we see the truth. 
The education system is not built to produce innovators, but obedient employees. The tech industry doesn't reward breakthrough, it rewards control. The media doesn't report innovation, it reports investments. Simon had neither a degree nor funding, but he had freedom. The freedom to think beyond the bounds of Western-defined possibility. And that freedom? That's the most dangerous thing of all. If you're a young person watching this, listen carefully. You do not need Silicon Valley to tell you you're smart. You do not need a university to validate your intelligence. You do not need a billion dollar budget to innovate. What you need is a mind that questions, a hand that builds, and a heart that refuses to wait. Simon Petrus built a phone, but he also built a legacy, a challenge, a warning shot. The next revolution won't come from Harvard. It won't come from Stanford. It won't be televised. It will come from the corners of forgotten classrooms from young minds dismissed by their own nations, from rebels who don't know they're supposed to stay silent. The age of permission is over. The era of innovation from the margins has begun. Simon Petrus lit the match. Now let's set the world ablaze, shatters. Then the multi-billion dollar telecom industry has a problem. It's using the Igbo model and other African disruptors to strengthen the argument, but let's go deeper. This SIM-free phone doesn't just disrupt telecoms, it disrupts something even more powerful the belief system that fuels global inequality. It punches a hole in the invisible wall built by Western education systems. Systems that condition young people to read, memorize and obey, but never to reason, question or create. Systems designed not to produce liberators, but laborers. You see, Simon Petrus didn't just build a phone, he cracked open the lie. Because if a Namibian teenager in a rural high school without access to elite laboratories or multi-million dollar research grants can invent a communication device that renders billion dollar infrastructures useless, then what excuse does the rest of the world have? Why are we paying $100,000 to attend Harvard? Why are our best minds drowning in student loans for degrees that lead to unemployment or job hunting? Why do we still believe that innovation must pass through the gates of Western validation? John D. Rockefeller, one of the architects of modern industrial schooling, once said, and that's exactly what Western schooling has produced, a global system that punishes creativity and rewards compliance, a system where genius must wear a tie, follow the syllabus, speak with a Western accent, and wait for approval before acting. But Simon didn't wait. He didn't ask for permission. He didn't study at MIT. He studied his surroundings. And with leftover television scraps, he created a device smarter than the phones you find on the shelves of luxury stores. No SIM, no airtime, no towers, just brilliance. And he's not the only one. The Igbo people of Nigeria are living proof that African minds can thrive outside colonial educational frameworks. During the brutal Biafran War of the late 1960s, the Igbos were isolated, blockaded, and denied resources. But what did they do? They built, they innovated, they manufactured their own fuel refineries, developed indigenous communication systems, built weapons and vehicles with no outside help, created a parallel economy under siege. That's what happens when education is geared towards problem solving, not just passing exams. Today, Igbo-dominated regions continue this legacy of applied intelligence. Their schools and apprenticeship systems produce real-world doers, not theoretical dreamers. Harvard itself has reportedly studied the Igbo model to understand how these so-called uneducated Africans build generational wealth, resilience and innovation without the need for Ivy League degrees. Let that sink in. The same West that mocked and marginalized African systems is now secretly studying them for answers. So what's the takeaway here? It's simple. Africa does not need Western education to lead the future. It needs liberated minds. The same system that told you to study hard, get a degree and get a job. Never told you that the CEOs of the world didn't follow that path. Never told you that the future is being shaped by dropouts, tinkerers, rebels and outsiders. They won't tell you about Maxwell Chikumbutso either, the Zimbabwean inventor who built a self-powered generator, electric cars and even aircrafts, all without a formal engineering degree. Why? Because he challenges the foundation, because his inventions don't just wow people, they threaten trillion dollar supply chains, because they prove that you can change the world without going into debt. And they're terrified of that truth. Western education is no longer about empowering the individual. It's about preserving control. They train you to be a perfect employee in a world that's already moved past that model. They teach you to memorize facts while the innovators are busy creating new facts. They trap you in a system of fees, exams, and meaningless certificates. While kids in Africa, kids like Simon, are inventing the future in silence. If you're reading this, hear this truth. Your freedom begins when your mind is free. And your mind is only free when... You stop asking for validation from the same system that exploits you. You stop believing that intelligence comes with a certificate. You start building, fixing, experimenting, failing, learning, and doing it all again. Simon Simfrey phone is a declaration of war on mental slavery. It tells every African child, you don't need permission to invent. You don't need a foreign visa to solve problems. You don't need Ivy League institutions to change lives. You don't need a million dollars. You just need a reason and a spark. The West told us to follow the rules, but they broke every rule to dominate the world. Now African youth are flipping the script with tools, with vision, and with courage. Imagine if every rural school had one Simon Petrus. 
Imagine if every child believed they had the right to create. Imagine if African education focused on reality, not routine. The world would shift, the lie would collapse, and innovation would no longer be measured by what's in your pocket, but by what's in your spirit. So as the world keeps pouring billions into AI that still can't answer basic human needs, as the newest smartphone still can't protect your data or your dignity, as Silicon Valley launches yet another overpriced gadget that does nothing new, remember, somewhere in Africa, a barefoot boy with no internet is building something greater and they can't stop it. Not with silence, not with censorship, not with curriculum, because you can't kill an idea whose time has come. And that idea, that Africa will rise on its own terms, with its own minds and without